I welcome you all in today's webinar. I am C.A. Naveen Vadva from Taxman Publications. For all the distinguished guests and speakers, it's my great pleasure for uh, me to welcome you all in today's webinar on uh, pillar, pillar 2 of the inclusive framework on BAPS. So we are deeply honored to have the presence of an influential and intellectual group of panelists to enlighten us about the new development. So today we have two speakers who will help us in understanding the new development, uh, Mr. Sanjay Kumar and Mr. Ashutosh Dixit. Sanjay is a partner with Deloitte India. He leads the firm's advanced pricing agreement and mutual agreement procedure projects, and it also helps in tax policy initiatives. So please join me in welcoming Sanjay sir in today's webinar. Welcome sir. The another panelist is Mr. Ashutosh Dixit. So he's a partner with Deloitte India. He has more than 30 years of experience covering the tax policy and legislation, international taxation and transfer pricing, tax administration and system. So please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Ashutosh Dixit. So now I'll not take your much time and we'll hand over the session uh, to Mr. Sanjay to take us forward and help us understanding the new development. Over to you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Naveenji. I hope I'm uh, clearly audible. Uh, so Naveen, uh, and uh, for uh, you know, thanks a lot, uh, Naveenji, for providing this uh, platform, which we all value. Uh, thanks for introducing us. Uh, uh, good afternoon, audience. Uh, Friends, we have come a long way uh, from the initial discussions uh, on the 2015 OECD final report, uh, laying out uh, 15 action points. Uh, these action point plans uh, had uh, helped us in creating a new framework of uh, global tax architecture based on uh, coherence, substance, transparency, and certainty. Digital taxation which was covered in uh, action plan one was uh, initially kept for a uh, separate treatment. The idea was to adequately address uh, the tax challenges uh, raised by digitization in a separate manner, but not separately from the existing tax system. The solutions were to be found uh, uh, within the existing concept. Uh, we have come uh, far away from there. And then the OECD and G20 countries brought the proposal seeking to allocate uh, profits uh, of the winners of globalization to market jurisdiction, which was uh, largely pillar one, and to the race to the bottom, to the uh, end the race to the bottom uh, by establishing a minimum uh, rate of tax of, of at least uh, 15%, that is pillar two. Today, we are going to look at an overwhelming majority uh, of 106 uh, out of 140 uh, countries agreeing to uh, what has been uh, on the pillar one on uh, and pillar two. Two of the four uh, these nations which have not uh, uh, agreed on the uh, signing the, the agreement uh, so far are our neighbors only. Significant to note that uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 are a package which uh, though operate uh, separately, but they have a combined impact. Uh, as we understand today, the impact of Pillar 1 proposal will be experienced by the world's largest uh, uh, companies uh, or MEs with a global uh, revenues of uh, greater than Euro uh, some 20 billion and most profitable corporations, whereas the impact of uh, pillar two proposals will be announced by the large corporations, uh, consolidated uh, global revenue greater than Euro 750, I think uh, 750 million, which I think has been borrowed uh, and brought in, in coherence with the CBCR requirement. Pillar one proposals uh, also entails uh, removal of uh, existing digital service taxes and other relevant uh, similar measures. Uh, that include, of course, uh, in India, the equalization levy. Uh, year, to year 2023 is being considered for implementation of both uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. In this webinar, 
we wish to discuss pillar two. The objective of uh, pillar two are twofold, and I think Ashutosh is going to explain that. First, it uh, intends to discourage uh, shifting of uh, profit from a high tax uh, jurisdiction to low or no tax jurisdiction, that is curbing the profit shifting. And the second is the level playing field uh, uh, for MNEs, irrespective of where they are headquarters, that thereby, uh, uh, you know, which hampers their, the harmful, brings the harmful tax competition. To achieve this, the proposal imposes, uh, as I mentioned, a uh, minimum level of taxation at the MNE level, and in respect of certain categories of payments that are more susceptible to BEPS. Uh, to discuss this, I have my colleague of 34 years, uh, Ashutosh Dixit, and there are many questions, where, uh, and uh, you know it, it, it will come. He will try and analyze that on the pillar two, and uh, also analyze the implication for India, since in India the effective corporate uh, tax uh, rate is between 26 percent to 34.94 percent. So, would, the question is, uh, would India be and affected by the pillar two proposal. The second question, which is coming here, is also about the flow rate in uh, pillar two being set at 15%. Uh, question is whether India uh, uh, would get an additional fiscal space to increase the tax rate, or would that hamper investments, etc. You would understand all these things and much more from Ashutosh. So, Ashutosh, over to you. Thank you, uh, Sanjay. And um, so, uh, uh, so, and uh, very good evening, listeners. Uh, the way I intend to uh, run the uh, this uh, webinar is that uh, we'll take somewhere around forty odd minutes and uh, ten to fifteen minutes for questions at the end. Um, the way I want to structure it is uh, is, for, is as we said, this webinar is about pillar two. So just to give you an introduction to Pillar 2, the, the three main elements of Pillar 2, uh, there are two domestic rules, which are called globe rules, and there's a, there's a third rule, which is a treaty provision. And then to take you through a few of the examples, because uh, uh, the, the implementation is going to be uh, complex, uh, as we would uh, you know, um, expect in case of uh, this kind of a coordination of a global minimum tax. And at the end of it, you know, uh, some uh, implications or possible policy implicate tax policy implications for India. Uh, we also have to realize that this is still a very dynamic subject because a lot of things are still under discussion. Uh, they uh, uh, very tight timelines have been set, but uh, we need to also realize that within these timelines, there are still a lot of open issues. So uh, based on what we discuss in this webinar, there may also be further developments uh, during the course of the coming months uh, where, you know, we get more clarity on, 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 uh, on many of these issues. So uh, just to uh, start off, uh, essentially, uh, what does uh, uh, Pillar 2 do? Pillar 1, uh, Sanjay has already spoken about. So essentially, uh, what, what is the most recent development is on the 8th of October, uh, 136 countries of the inclusive framework uh, they have agreed uh, to this inclusive uh, framework statement uh, covering Pillar uh, 1 and Pillar 2. And uh, it was presented to the G20 finance ministers uh, on the 18th of October. And it's going to be presented to the G20 leaders, uh, uh, you know, end of this month. So essentially, um, all of these uh, uh, agreements in a way have, have almost universal approval. There are a couple of jurisdictions who have still not signed on, uh, on this, but one would expect that it should happen in the near future. Uh, the pillar two is essentially uh, looking at, 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 a ways, at a way to impose, or I would say at a way to ensure that uh, multinational enterprises pay a minimum of 15% in any jurisdiction which they operate. So, so it is a minimum of a tax of 15% in any jurisdiction which they operate. And uh, like uh, Sanjay mentioned, the, the logic or, or the motivation behind this was that countries should not compete uh, with each other on tax rates uh, 
uh, to the extent that you know they beggar them, themselves in terms of tax uh, collections. We know that with COVID and uh, you know with with all uh, COVID pandemic and all these environmental challenges before us, uh, governments need uh, taxes uh, to uh, to invest uh, in public uh, goods and in public utilities. So that essentially is the is the framework behind this. And like I mentioned, this is a country by country basis, meaning that. Uh, uh, that the ME will uh, will need to be paying a minimum of fifteen percent uh, with respect to any jurisdiction in, in which it operates. How it will uh, and who will collect this tax? How it will be done? We will come to when we uh, go. To, uh, you know when we uh, go to uh, our future slides. So let me come to the next one. So what are the essential elements of uh, Pillar Two? Uh, so one is what we call the global anti-base erosion rules or the GLOBE rules. Uh, that is the acronym. And besides that, a treaty provision. Uh, the, GLO these, uh, the GLOBE rules are two. Uh, one is the income inclusion rule and the other is the undertaxed payments rule. Now what both of these rules uh, do together is that they operate so that there is a top up. There is a top up. Uh, tax paid up to a minimum rate of 15% by the multinational enterprise. Uh, uh, essentially, when we go to the next few slides, we will say that essentially the purpose is that uh, the MNE pays it, pays this top up tax, uh, not in the jurisdiction where it is uh, where it is low tax, but it has to pay this top up tax in its by its ultimate parent entity in that particular jurisdiction where its ultimate parent entity is located. That is the principle here. So essentially what it is saying is it is not telling any jurisdiction that you have to have a minimum rate of 15%. But what it's essentially giving a signal is that if you don't tax at the minimum rate of 15%, some other jurisdiction will be able to make up that difference and the m &E will be paying tax in that jurisdiction. Uh, so this is what the income inclusion rule is. Uh, attached to the income inclusion rule, and I'll not uh, dwell on it much, is a switchover rule because, uh, as I mentioned to you, if this particular income is to be, uh, which is the, the top up tax, if it is to be imposed in the country where the ultimate parent entity of the MNE group is, then, um, then uh, in certain cases, what has happened is through bilateral tax treaties. Uh, there are uh, mostly there are credit provisions, but there are also tax exemption provisions where a country may have agreed that if an income is taxed in the other country, it would exempt that income. Now, if you have if you are bound by a treaty to exempt that income, then how will you impose the IIR top up tax? So there will also be a switch over rule where uh, where these bilateral tax treaties will get uh, amended so that the exemption rule uh, gets overtaken by a credit uh, rule so that you can give credit for taxes paid uh, in the other country, but you won't exempt that income. So this is, uh, you know, one of the minor uh, uh, points in this, but again, uh, which will uh, which will need uh, implementation as part of the income inclusion rule. The under tax payment rule is like a backstop to the income inclusion rule. And we will come to that when we come to uh, when we discuss this. But essentially what this is saying is that despite there being an income inclusion rule, there will be circumstances where still that particular uh, ME is not uh, does not end up paying uh, tax up to the top up rate, uh, you know, in case of certain jurisdictions. And there could be reasons, for example, the parent jurisdiction where the where the ultimate parent entity is, where, the, where it doesn't impose any tax because this is still optional in that sense so therefore a, a subordinate entity may be and you can have still you can still have circumstances therefore where a particular constituent entity in a low tax jurisdiction is not paying tax of the top up rate um, under the iir and therefore you need a utpr and that then acts like a uh, like a safeguard the third is a, a treaty provision this is a this is called a priority rule although i mentioned at the end this essentially is uh, has come a lot because of the insistence of developing countries and what it basically does is that before you apply the globe rules you will uh, there will be certain source country taxation of specific intra group payments uh, of the many group 
So if there are any intra-group payments of the m &E group and they become covered, and we'll discuss that under STTR, then uh, that particular uh, payment will first get subject to uh, um, uh, to a withholding, which is which comes under a subject to tax rule, and then that will also get credited to what the um, what the constituent entity payments have been for the MNE. And since th since that has gone to the source country, therefore naturally wherever uh, the MNE pays the the resultant top up tax. That will get reduced because uh, because the source country has already uh, garnered some of that particular tax. So this is a gross level of taxation. Again, uh, this is a third element, and this will require uh, amendment to to the tax treaties. And therefore, as we see, this is a mammoth exercise. And if you if as I go to the next slide, you'll see what are the timelines in relation to you know these which has been put up. So uh, these are the uh, stated timelines as of now. Like I said, this is a dynamic situation. Uh, but by November 2021, which is uh, you know uh, just a month away, uh, the uh, the attempt will be that model rules to define the scope and mechanics of the globe rules. Like I said, the globe rules being the IIR and the UTPR, that they are, those would be in place, and also the model treaty provision. Uh, supplemented by a commentary to give effect to the STTR, uh, which is the subject to tax rule, because that will have to go and um, amend uh, uh, bilateral treaties. And uh, then the, the second step is that by uh, mid 2022, the multilateral instrument, instrument for implementing the STTR in relevant bilateral treaties, that should be in place. So this will be a multilateral instrument seems which is uh, separate from the multilateral instrument which is currently in place for the other BEPS provisions. And then the attempt is that by the end of 2022, there would be an implementation framework to facilitate the coordinated uh, implementation of these globe rules. So essentially, uh, as I've mentioned, there are going to be a lot of, lot of nitty gritties. They'll also need to be oversight. So there will have to be an implementation framework uh, in terms of how all of this uh, will get implemented by different countries and, uh, you know, how do we uh, uh, fix up any gaps or anything which comes in the implementation. So that they wish to uh, accomplish by end of 2022. And as was mentioned earlier, then the attempt is that by 2023, the pillar two is implemented, uh, except for the under tax payment rule. Like I said, that is a backstop. And when we come to it, there could be theoretically a position where you may not need a UTPR, though uh, practically that may not be the case. And that is why 2024 is the implementation for the UTPR. So this essentially is, like I said, ambitious timeline. And uh, let us uh, then, you know, have a look at what are the two domestic rules which I talked to you about, which is the globe rules. So who will get covered? So um, an m &E group with a total consolidated group revenue of uh, Euro 750 million or above in the preceding financial year is clear that will uh, that those will be the ones who are in scope under pillar two. Uh, the other thing is that uh, since these are domestic rules, if you if you notice both uh, the, the IR and the UTPR. So countries, uh, and especially we are talking about the IIR right now, uh, countries have been given uh, after, uh, the scope and they are free to apply the IIR to MNEs headquartered in their countries at thresholds which are even lower than Euro 750 million. Now, I will come to this when we uh, speak about India's uh, tax policy options uh, you know, towards the end. Uh, but uh, this essentially is the, is the second part that although 750 million is the is 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 what has been agreed but individual countries can choose to have lower thresholds uh, in case of the iir uh, so then cons consolidating uh, the group revenue threshold includes all the constituent entities owned and controlled by the same ultimate parent entity so this is essentially uh, 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 the definition of who will get included in the mne group and uh, already we have, uh, you know, CBCR rules where the same definitions, uh, uh, similar definitions apply. And uh, then certain UPs are to be excluded. 
uh, which means certain uh, ultimate parent entities. So that's been agreed that, you know, very specific uh, financial services uh, organizations like investment funds, uh, pension funds, the sovereign wealth funds. These are international uh, organizations, non-profit organizations. They have been excluded from the scope of, uh, of, of these globe rules. And there is also a separate exclusion for international shipping income because that uh, the, the shipping income is uh, international shipping um, income is currently taxed in a different way. And there is a separate convention for it um, uh, in, in terms of all, uh, you know, international ship shipping. So that has also been excluded. Now, when we come to the next is then I want to now speak in length about the first global rule, which is the income inclusion rule. Now, what the um, inclusion uh, income inclusion rule uh, does that it is it it, it uh, basically takes a top down approach. So what the top down approach is, is that this approach gives priority to the application of the income inclusion rule in the jurisdiction of the constituent entity that is at or near the top of the ownership change chain in the m &E group. So essentially is that if if uh, the ultimate parent entity, uh, the, the, the jurisdiction where the ultimate parent entity is, the IIR would start from there. And theoretically, therefore, if uh, if that jurisdiction entity has implemented an IIR, then that would be the one which would be responsible for collecting the top up tax. And that tax jurisdiction would also then get this entire top up tax, uh, which it uh, which it uh, gets computed based on this global minimum tax. So also it applies only on that portion of the low tax income of a CE which is beneficially owned directly or indirectly by the parent entity. So there are a number of rules there to ensure that. And like I said, there is a top down approach. Uh, the computation of the uh, of, of of how much the top up tax rate and uh, top up tax amount will be is actually a function of uh, of two things. So we are talking about, let's say, uh, a jurisdiction where the global minimum uh, rate is below 15%. Then the question actually to ask is that how do I get to know that the global minimum rate is in this jurisdiction is lower than 15%. So for that, there is uh, uh, there is the concept of um, effective tax rate and covered taxes and globe income, which we'll cover uh, in, in subsequent slides, uh, you know, through an example. Uh, if you, um, of course, India doesn't have controlled foreign company rules. But uh, uh, all, actually, a number of the most of the OECD countries have, and uh, the way the IIR is structured, it takes um, it takes on many design elements, which are there in currently uh, in the current uh, CFC rules in these jurisdictions. So, uh, of course, uh, the major difference is that unlike a CFC rule, which applies on a standalone basis uh, for a constituent entity in a particular jurisdiction. The IIR is going to be applied to a consolidated financials uh, of the m &E in that jurisdiction. So essentially, uh, the incomes will be consolidated because in order to get to the rate of 15% to calculate that, you will be looking at all the incomes of, uh, of a constituent entity in a particular jurisdiction. That is a major distinction. There are other distinctions also, but that's not the subject matter you know, of uh, what we are discussing today. Um, there is also a de minimis exclusion for jurisdictions uh, where the m &E has revenues of less than a euro 10 million and profits of less than euro 1 million. So essentially a material materiality concept in that sense that, you know, where um, where the where the profits and the incomes are, are, are below a particular level that will uh, get excluded from uh, the scope of these globe rules. Now. As I was mentioning in the uh, when I was discussing the previous slide, uh, how do we come to know that a particular constituent entity, um, you know, has uh, uh, has a min global minimum rate uh, which is less than fifteen percent? So you therefore you have a concept of of the effective tax rate in that jurisdiction, and uh, that effective tax rate is a function of two uh, elements: the covered taxes. 
and the tax base. Now, the covered taxes, uh, they have been taken to be uh, tax on an entity's income or profits, including a tax on distributed profits and includes any taxes imposed in lieu of a generally applicable income tax. Uh, it also includes taxes on retained earnings and corporate equity. Uh, the definitions which have been used for uh, statistical purposes by many international organizations when they do their uh, calculations for taxes collected by different jurisdictions, for example, uh, by the IMF and the World Bank. It's the, uh, so this particular rule also uses the same, uh, the, uh, those same uh, statistical uh, definitions. And uh, of course, it, it specifically mentions the blueprint on pillar two, certain specified inclusions and uh, exclusions. Um, the uh, some of the inclusions in the cover taxes specifically mentioned are, uh, as I said, any tax on the entity's income or profits, tax on distributed profits, taxes imposed in lieu of a generally applicable income tax, uh, taxes based on multiple uh, components, taxes on retained earnings and taxes paid under CFC rules. So these are some of the inclusions. Some of the ex exclusions are uh, consumption and sales taxes, excise taxes, uh, digital services taxes are excluded, uh, stamp and other transfer taxes. So essentially, if you see those which are not in the nature of direct taxes and uh, payroll taxes are, and social security contributions have also been excluded as well as property taxes. So that essentially will be the covered taxes which will be uh, commonly taken across all jurisdictions in terms of the de definition. Then this is applied to the covered taxes will be the numerator and that is applied to the denominator, which is the globe income. Now, what is the globe income is it's the tax base, uh, which is determined in accordance with the financial accounting standards um, used by the parent entity in preparing its in preparing its consolidated financial statements. Um, that uh, is the case, but uh, um, then the determination of profit or loss of each uh, C of the m &E group. So that will be done uh, based on based on this definition. And then there will again be certain specified adjustments uh, uh, to the to the tax base. And some of those adjustments, there are a number of adjustments which have been mentioned. Like I said, there's a comprehensive uh, blueprint in the pillar two document. Uh, just uh, for uh, reference, some of them are exclusion of intercompany items in the same jurisdiction so that they, they, they should cancel each other out. And then, you know, HOPE transactions, which have been considered for determining taxable income, they are, uh, they are to be uh, considered. Uh, uh, there's exclusion of gain loss from disposition of stock. So there are a number of at least a dozen odd items which are our adjustments which can add or subtract from this particular globe income tax base. Uh, I refer you to the to the pillar two uh, blueprint document. But essentially, again, the, uh, the 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 effort here is to have a common definition so that it is applied commonly across jurisdictions to get at that particular global minimum rate. Uh, one other uh, element. Uh, of uh, computing the tax, uh, the ETR, and uh, which is essentially the globe income, the tax base, that the the blueprint talks about a formulaic substance based carve out. Now, uh, what essentially uh, it is saying is that uh, the logic behind this is that even though I am operating in a low tax jurisdiction, let's say I have a substantial business activity there. And the blueprint recognizes that that substantial business activity could be reflected through the payrolls, uh, you know, in that uh, jurisdiction, as well as through the use of tangible assets uh, that so uh, so what it does is that uh, in case uh, what, uh, you know, what, uh, whatever is the payroll component and whatever is the tangible asset component that is marked up. So there's a 10% markup and, uh, you know, um, the markup itself uh, will be reduced over the years uh, in so, so as to get to uh, you know a more standard rate but right now the markup will start at 10 percent and uh, so that will be a markup and for tangible assets there will be uh, what we call uh, you know essentially a carrying value of the tangible assets what you would call depreciation essentially so a particular specific uh, depreciation rate will also be applied in case of tangible assets 
and uh, both of these then will go to reduce the tax base in that constituent entity's uh, jurisdiction and therefore uh, to that extent that 15% uh, tax rate uh, will only come in after these adjustments are also made to the to the global income which is the denominator gets reduced in that particular sense so these are the formulaic substance based carve outs which have been mentioned in the pillar 2 blueprint and these essentially then will combine as i said the numerator is the covered taxes the denominator is the globe income as adjusted uh, for the various elements i just mentioned and then as a result of that you will get what is the tax and what is the effective tax rate so like i said this is done at the level of the entire jurisdiction so just uh, quickly uh, a brief example of this uh, if you look at it, uh, the the computation of the ITR, and I will just, you know, um, uh, draw your attention to the fact that uh, we have the uh, we have a state A right at the bottom. That is, let's say, this low tax jurisdiction state. So it has got three entities, uh, uh, which are controlled uh, in this MNE group by C Limited, which is right at state C, right at the top. So essentially, what uh, this jurisdictional blending is doing is that it is taking the incomes of A1, A2, and the PE. And if you look at, uh, you know, at the top, then uh, uh, then their, their globe incomes are there uh, in, in terms of uh, each of the jurisdictions, uh, which is the second row. The covered taxes is the taxes they've actually paid. So the consolidated is 351. The globe income consolidated is 3,900. And therefore, the effective tax rate, which is the sum of one, uh, is the is the division of one by the second, is uh, nine percent, and the minimum rate, as we know, is fifteen, which has been agreed. So the top up IIR then becomes fifteen minus nine, which is six, and therefore, that amount is two fifty four, which gets allocated to each of these three entities. Of course, this taxes will then be paid by C Limited. This is what I wanted to point out. These taxes will be paid, this 254, by C limited to the jurisdiction C on the assumption that jurisdiction C will have the IIR. It will have implemented any, uh, an IIR rate. Uh, the, 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 the second part of this, uh, the bottom part, the scenario two, was just to show you, uh, you know, uh, uh, another example where you actually have uh, one of the entities uh, having a loss. So if you see the third column, the PE has a loss of minus 100. Now, because of that, naturally, the global income also gets reduced and the ETR gets reduced to 8% instead of the 9%, which was there earlier. Uh, but the main thing is that the allocation then uh, will only be to A1 and A2. Naturally, since the PE has made a loss, so there's no allocation to it. But then there is a higher allocation to A1 and A2. And this again will get paid at the level of the uh, this 175 will, be get, uh, will get paid at the level of state C by C limited uh, because that is the ultimate parent entity and we are proceeding on the assumption that state C will have implemented an IIR. Now uh, also uh, in, in calculating this tax base in this jurisdiction, there will also be, you know, historically there may be certain carry forward losses which these cons uh, constitute entities may have uh, had. Uh, so uh, there is, so there's loss carry forward, they could be uh, you know, uh, IR tax credit, there are excess taxes. So essentially carry forward of losses and excess taxes, there is a separate adjustment for that, uh, which is again mentioned in the blueprint. So that will also uh, go into the determination of the final uh, um, covered tax rate in that particular jurisdiction. So this essentially then what we were talking about was the, was the income inclusion rule. Uh, now, uh, since we have the in in inclusion rule, uh, um, uh, like I mentioned, if uh, if if the ultimate parent entity uh, has uh, uh, in that jurisdiction, the ultimate parent entity's jurisdiction, if that has Im implemented an income uh, inclusion rule, then actually you will not need a under tax payment rule. Uh, but what uh, the pillar, uh, what the blueprint assumes is that maybe people, uh, countries may be implementing, uh, you know, the IIRs during different periods. Uh, some may choose not to implement the IIR, 
and therefore in order to therefore preserve the integrity of this entire system so that the mne is actually paying 15% tax for each of the constituent uh, jurisdictions where it is operating therefore you have this backstop rule which is the under tax payment rule now um, so it has the same general purpose as the ir as i mentioned it serves as a backstop and it applies only to those constituent entities in the mne group that are not controlled by an entity further up the chain that applies an iir and uh, quickly to you know uh, give you an example where a utpr theoretically could come into play if you uh, see the diagram here uh, i would want to point you out to the bottom part which shows country which shows country d now uh, if you see uh, country d all the constituent entities the ultimate parent entity is the holdco which is sitting in country a right but the uh, what we are assuming here is that let us say that country a does not impose an iir so it is not implementing an income inclusion rule then like i said under the top down approach the jurisdiction just below the holdco that is supposed to implement it and in this case we are saying seeing that country b as well as country c they have imposed an iir and therefore to that extent dco1 and dco2 their top up tax gets paid into um, bco and uh, uh, similarly for dco3 and dco4 their top up tax gets paid into cco but if you see uh, since dco5 is directly owned by holdco it's it has no ownership component from uh, you know bco or cco therefore the now this begs the question how will the top up tax which relates to this particular entity in this case you know uh, it comes to 10 uh, that is that is merely a computation how will this get uh, you know collected and how will this get paid by the mne because the ir will no longer apply to this since uh, there is no control uh, here the holdco is controlling but there is no IR, uh, control at the level of the iir and the ones below uh, do not have an ownership component so this essentially is where the utpr comes into play um the that how this particular um, uh, um the, this particular tax will get collected in case the iir is not able to do it so how does this uh, under tax payment rule then uh, work it operates through an allocation key and it's uh, limited to the extent of intra group payments so it assumes that there will be intra group payments uh, within that group and it will use uh, leverage that to collect the under tax uh, payments under the under tax payment rules within that there are primary allocation keys and secondary allocation keys this is uh, so there's there's a level at two levels and then of course under utpr also there are certain exclusions which have been there uh, which which uh, which have been mentioned uh, essentially more to do with uh, with you know a de minimis kind of a situation also that you know because the utpr will be implemented right at uh, the end after the iir so there are also uh, you know some time has been given for mnes to be able to adjust to a utpr so th those are the kind of exclusions and and you know time period uh, extensions which have been mentioned but essentially again to give you a flavor of how uh, you know uh, the utpr could get collected and this is a very simple example again Uh, again uh, you know we have the same uh, diagram as before but now what we essentially we are saying is that dco5 like i had pointed out that dco5 is a case where uh, under the iir you are not able to collect this particular top up tax of 10 so now in this uh, example what we assume what we have assumed is that there are inter say intergroup payments between bco and uh, dco5 and also between cco and dco5 so uh, when these intergroup payments uh, take place then in that case uh, uh, from those inter uh, intergroup payments uh, those particular expenses either deductions will be disallowed to bco and cco because the deductions will be disallowed to the extent that there is a top up tax uh, levable so therefore they will end up paying um, the group will end up paying this top up tax Uh, you know in the bco and cco jurisdictions because even though they don't uh, have a ownership component in dco5 there are intergroup payments between them so that essentially is what uh, you know this uh, slide is talking about uh, but 
but one thing here which you know is the it, what still begs the question is that suppose there are no intergroup payments between bco and seco and deco5 then there is the secondary you know allocation key which uh, is, is is a more complex one because then it looks at other intergroup payments and uses that there are examples uh, of this given in the blueprint documents so i am not uh, for paucity of time i'll not be covering that but this essentially is the logic of a utpr again i wanted to emphasize that on paper or theoretically you could have a situation where utpr is not needed because if every country uh, chooses uh, rationally let's say to actually impose an iir at its level then this could actually be a backstop which may not need to be used so although it's quite complex to the extent that it may uh, it may be only implemented in very few uh, cases uh, you know uh, if the iir is actually implemented across the board now uh, the, the, the third one which is the subject to tax rule is the one which i had mentioned to you is a priority rule now why do we say that it's a priority rule uh, because what it does is that certain intergroup payments uh, between the source country and the pay country if that intergroup payment uh, is not taxed at a particular uh, minimum rate or gross rate in this case what has been agreed at 9% then the source country is allowed to uh, to tax the differential in terms of uh, uh, the differential in the margin let's say uh, that the source tax country has a has a withholding rate of 5% and the minimum rate is 9% uh, and in the other jurisdiction this is not taxed at 9% then that differential of 4% will get collected by the source country now why is this a priority rule because this will happen first and therefore in the constituent jurisdiction in the jurisdiction where um, where the low tax jurisdiction is in that case that will jurisdiction will get the credit yes that this much tax has already been paid and therefore to that extent the mne group will not have to pay that tax again when it uh, pays taxes in its uh, ultimate parent entity's jurisdiction so to that extent this becomes a priority rule because the collection happens before and this gets credited to the to the payments which the mne group has made and therefore when it computes its top up tax to that extent it will get a credit and therefore it won't have to make that payment in the in its ultimate parent entity jurisdiction and that essentially is what we are saying is that again the sttr it's it stand alone treaty based rule it applies only to cross border payments between connected persons it's based on a common control uh there are uh you know exclusions uh certain exclusions which have been mentioned uh right now the the open question is that although interest and royalties are have been specifically mentioned there are other possible payments which have been mentioned in the blueprint document like franchise fees uh you know insurance reinsurance premiums guarantee brokerage now these currently seem to be all still a matter of negotiation you know whether which of these payments will actually get included under the sttr and of course the other thing is that there will have to be administrative approaches and administrative mechanisms uh, decided how to go ahead and do this uh, that will be a separate uh, set of uh, you know um, uh, set of rules which will need to get implemented if all of this has to be done uh, and implemented in 2023 so essentially uh, the rule is triggered like i said when the nominal tax rate on that particular payment is lower than 9% in its jurisdiction where the income is received and it is uh, therefore the prerogative of the source country if it has uh, a bilateral tax treaty and that tax treaty actually covers that particular payment then it can actually tax to the uh, tax that additionality in its own jurisdiction uh just again you know an example to give you of the priority rule and you know uh, we are um, uh, we are 45 minutes into our broadcast so essentially i wanted to show to you in this particular slide uh, what uh, what essentially wanted to show to you is that uh, this is a case where uh, you know the the covered taxes again we are looking at the bottom which is country c which is the low tax jurisdiction now here if you see country c uh there are uh, um, there are uh, taxes which it has paid is basically 4 and 5 now if i go up uh, if i go up it is because there is a 
interstate payment from BCO1 to, to CCO1. Now, this payment has already been subjected to, a, uh, to an STTR, subject to tax rate. And that subjected to tax rate is therefore has already been deducted in the case of CCO1. How, uh, what is the computation that is uh, shown here in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the, of the example? So the covered taxes, which then have been paid by CCO1 in country C are uh, four. Four is what has been paid under the STTR, STTR and five is what has been paid otherwise by this uh, company. So it has paid a total of, um, uh, of nine and therefore its effective tax rate comes to 4.5. Now here, uh, like we said, since the STTR has been implemented, now still it will be subject to a to an income inclusion rule because its effective tax rate uh, is still, uh, you know, uh, lower than 15 uh, and therefore it's 4.5. So therefore this 10.5 percentage that top up tax amount comes to 21 that it will pay in its parent jurisdiction that is hold in country A. But you would have noticed that uh, this is uh, that this has been computed after the STTR has been paid by CCO1. So to that extent, Holdco is paying a lower uh, lower amount in country A because it has already been taxed on this uh, intergroup payment through the STTR. So that essentially what this slide is uh, talking about. Uh, just to you know, um, uh, for your uh, knowledge and if people are interested, there is a there is a comprehensive blueprint document on all of this, and uh, there are you know uh, I've given the link below. There are different chapter headings covering, you know, the kind of stuff which I was just talking about. So, you know, please feel uh, welcome to uh, have a look at those. It's in the public domain. Uh, now, uh, coming to the, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to our final part, which is, you know, what are the policy issues for India? So some, of course, uh, you know, um, uh, as I had mentioned, uh, and, uh, you know, also mentioned earlier that the timelines are very ambitious. There's supposed to be certain uh, things which are already happening in November 2021. And uh, then uh, by by middle of 2022, we're supposed to have, uh, you know, um, the implementation itself in terms of, of, of uh, the multilateral instrument and the rules. And uh, again, uh, ambitiously by 2023, this is supposed to be on the ground. So that if, if, if that is the case, then of course, India will also be implementing the globe rules, which is our first bullet on a many groups with a turnover threshold exceeding Euro 750 million. Uh, in India's case, uh, there will not be uh, many such uh, many groups. Uh, uh, substantially, most of these many groups are US or uh, uh, Europe based. Uh, but the interesting part is that uh, is that uh, under the IIR, uh, uh, jurisdictions are also allowed to apply the IIR to, uh, to their MNEs who are headquartered in India at a lower threshold. Why I mention this is that India does not have um, controlled foreign company. Uh, it doesn't have control for foreign company uh, provisions. Uh, they were introduced uh, in the direct access code bill of 2010, but uh, that lapsed since uh, in parliament. So uh, essentially, so therefore, there is no CFC in India's domestic legislation. In a lot of the other countries, because of the CFCs, they are already collecting taxes, you know, on passive income, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, which is getting generated abroad in lower tax jurisdictions. Uh, yeah, so in the case of India, policymakers will have to take this particular call, whether they want to also apply the IIR to uh, at a lower threshold in order to, uh, you know, tax... Um, uh, in order to implement a 15, uh, you know, percent tax in that way. Of course, uh, th in these cases, that's the only the IIR is a domestic uh, provision. This won't uh, be, you know, subjected. This is this won't come under STTR or any of the other provisions. Then the third thing, of course, will be to harmonize the road rules to ensure that there is no double taxation risk given the prevailing tax framework. And we also know that India does have incentives for Dividends, for example, dividends uh, coming back to many groups in India from abroad, they are taxed at lower rates. So those are very good provisions uh, because uh, they incentivize uh, uh, the uh, the repatriation of dividends. So all of these things will need to be considered while India implements uh, these rules. And uh, one would hope that there is extensive uh, stakeholder engagement 
before implementing these rules through discussion papers uh, and uh, you know other seminars like i said there is still time because 2023 is the implementation date as of now uh, ambitious uh, but i think uh, you know we have interesting times ahead and uh, many more discussions as a lot of these other issues also get crystallized in the coming months so with that um, over to you sanjay thank you so oh, thanks thanks uh, ashutosh for laying it out uh, so well and precisely in about 40 minutes i must say so you were right on the time and it's a very vast topic and uh, uh, you know if you see uh, and quite complex i must say uh, it's not that easy that one understands uh, very easily uh, but uh, you have laid it out quite well and with certain examples how the profit will be shifted from one company to the another company uh, i have few uh, you know i can see a few questions from my, from the audience uh, let me ask you in case uh, you uh, you know because there are many ifs and buts in all these things uh, so i would want to ask you uh, two three questions if that is all right one yes, question please. which has, uh, one question which has come would the utpr affect the sovereignty of market jurisdiction since taxing power is essentially the sovereign power of each country uh, uh so so if we are uh, looking at the utpr uh, we are looking at at something which will be uh, which will be uh, decided among all the jurisdictions so um, if if all the jurisdictions decide that they uh, that they uh, you know wish to do this then essentially it's a matter of the sovereign uh, you know uh, deciding whether he wants to cede certain powers or not but in my in, in this case uh, uh, you know i understand it slightly differently because this is actually giving a chance to somebody else right uh, in the sense that if you are uh, if your iir if you do if you're not going to impl implement the iir then some other jurisdiction will get the will 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 get the right to you know uh, to to collect that particular tax uh, we are talking about of course yes that there is no control and therefore you know uh, how would the utpr get implemented but then then that essentially is pooled sovereignty which we are talking about the whole reason behind pillar 1 and pillar 2 is so that all the countries get together and agree so once you have agreed then you know uh, then the sovereign itself has agreed then and who are we <laughs> <laughs> no no exactly uh, ashutosh but uh, you know another point uh, which comes out of it that in general what is the the the, the pillar 1 and pillar 2 have done that there is a, they are bringing certain kind of harmonization across the the countries that you cannot have less than 15% and things like that so that the sovereignty as a concept uh, which was uh, so uh, important for each country and they were safeguarding it over a period of time that has certainly got a hit uh, you know and uh, yeah. everybody has to compromise uh, and uh, no. one, you know the another two countries in our neighborhood that they are talking about it because they have certain issues so they are not signing the yeah. agreement so so you know countries are organizing themselves and giving bartering away something to get something else in extra in in true in, true so in i extra. would only say yeah i would only add here is that you know we've seen a general push against globalization in 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 other issues what on yeah. tax actually over the last 3 4 yeah, years you know the, the we're way. actually seeing much more globalization uh, so therefore uh, and this globalization is as you said you know i would call it more like harmonization and i think you know there has to be certain amount of give and take if you know uh, one uh, because if if you're taxing entities across the globe which are across border then that has to you know there there would be some give and take on that yes so let me take one or two more questions one is uh, uh, countries like us uk canada etc have various incentives like r and d credits etc will the etr for uh, pillar 2 be considered after taking into account the tax credits under these schemes ideally the etr uh, before these incentives uh, could be say 25% but it drops to something uh, that's the question that has come yeah. from one person so again like i said there are at least you know uh, more than a dozen adjustments which have been mentioned with regard to the tax base 
I'm I'm quite sure that this is also you know uh, part of the discussion. Uh, but what uh, what what one principle which they did decide was that you know if you look you talked about the harmful tax regimes under BEPS. So they they said that even if your tax regime clears that hurdle and it's not a harmful tax regime, for example, our, our India's R and D tax regime is not considered harmful, and there are, there are others in that. But they said even though it it it's, it, it it crosses that hurdle. But it will still be taken into account while uh, computing the adjusted tax uh, base under GLOBE. So, uh, so my, my, you know, my, uh, my prime of SI understanding is that all of these taxes will be uh, taken into account. Uh, but like I said, one will have to see, really go and see the you know, nitty gritties and the fine print uh, in, in each country's case. No, and that framework will come into play because every country will be watching the other country like a hawk, right? <laughs> Yeah. But Ashutosh, the another point is that if uh, something like these uh, tax credits, if they are shaving off a lot of profit and in the divisible pool you have a lesser amount, uh, then obviously the, the, it could create a little bit of imbalance also in the overall structure that the, uh, the pillar, pillar 2 and pillar 1 are trying to uh, bring it on the ground. Yeah, sure. So, so that is why I agree. But that is why I would expect that this would also get harmonized. So yeah, this will get harmonized. At the moment, I don't think they have mentioned it, but I'm sure uh, mm. going forward, uh, those smaller details will be looked at it. Let me ask you one more question and then we close this, uh, 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 which is about the, in case the of STR, STTR, the withholding tax would be on gross amount, whereas the minimum global tax is at 15% on net income. So how will that be taken care of? Okay, so uh, I did mention it, but I wanted to emphasize that for the STTR, the agreed rate is 9% gross. So the 15% is for the global minimum tax. For the STTR, the agreed, uh, you know, based on the, the October uh, statement, it's 9%. So the differential will be calculated on 9%. In that other jurisdiction, they will look at what is the nominal tax rate on that particular income stream. And if it is less than 9%, then that differential uh, will go to the source. Uh, tax. So that is what. I don't recall that whether on slide five, there was uh, the cover taxes included uh, equalization levy. Uh, but uh, if you recall that uh, in that uh, granular aspect, then, uh, we can just so again, uh, uh, you know, um, I would need to go through. Uh, so exclusions, yes, digital service taxes. Uh, it doesn't mention in the slide, but yeah. in the fine print, the blue in the blueprint fine print, digital taxes, uh, digital services taxes have been excluded. Yeah, they have been excluded from cover taxes. So yeah, therefore, I, yeah, therefore, and, what and you're paying also, under pillar also, one, therefore, what you're paying under pillar one will you will not get credit for that. Yeah, and obviously this is coming in various hues. Uh, it's not that uh, equalization levy, or what has been implemented in India, is the way the Australia has done that, or some other country has done that. So there are a lot of variations on that. So uh, I think uh, um, uh, I think we have covered most of these. Uh, so I have one point for Ashutosh sir. Uh, so India has been quite proactive. So after this action uh, plan uh, one, uh, uh, the Bax project. So India has been very proactively brought equalization levy immediately in finance 2016. So do you think any possibility of some major changes in the upcoming budget of finance 2022? I, I, I don't think so. And the reason is this, because this is now a part of a global agreement mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, they have, they, they have set out a timeline. Uh, mm -hmm. We are not covering global. For example, pillar one is not the subject of this particular webinar. But just as we laid out, you know, what is going to happen under pillar two for pillar one. Also, there are timelines. Mm -hmm. One of the timelines is that, you know, once pillar one is comes into play, which is basically that, you know, those uh, the, the MNE group will 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 distribute taxes and start paying taxes, you know, on the amount A. Then at that point of time, the other countries will withdraw now withdrawal. But if you see the withdrawal will be only for those MNE groups which are covered, uh, you know, under the pillar one. Because they are like uh, Sanjay mentioned, 20 billion or whatever. So there will be a lot of ME, ME groups who don't get covered. So, you know, you could still ha have uh, digital taxes in those cases where, you know, pillar one uh, doesn't come into play. 
the other angle uh, navin ji is that uh, india already has an ongoing dispute with the united states under the you know the usdpr and there uh, the 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 what we need to watch out is that actually a lot of the other countries have now agreed with uh, with the us they have come to a negotiation with the us where their cases have been dropped because we just read recently that there has been a compromise which has been agreed between you know uh, both of them which basically talked about the fact that you know once the pillar one comes into play then you know we will give credit for the taxes which they have already you know these particular many groups have already made mm -hmm. so i'm uh, so let's wait and, and watch and see what happens uh, between india and us on this particular issue there is now a blueprint laid out for that also in that sense so it means a very uh, big way ahead so once this is implemented so india will have to modify you know of the entire treaty network will so not just india and navin Ah, the entire all, all the world is doing it. Yeah. So if if I, if we focus on India only, so that's why I I specifically took the name of India. Sure. So that will see a lot of changes in the treaty networks, the taxation laws. So very you know big task ahead for India and especially for the tax consultants. Yes, but, uh, I mean this is going things. to change the overall architecture, mm -hmm. and there will be and you know another thing. It started with action one, but it seemed to be permeating onto another aspect also. So we'll need to watch out on that and see how does it happen, yes. etc. Because uh, you know uh, we are talking about only at the moment uh, two proposals. The way it comes out when it gets finalized and you know fi the final aspects are coming out, mm -hmm. then every country will start uh, have to will have to do a final thing. So my sense is that just to keep the short, short point, budget 22 looks tough. Okay. But it could come out as a separate, uh, you know, uh, legislation, uh, separate finance act to incorporate few things. Okay. If the pressure comes down, that, that, that. Okay, so and so before we sign off, any closing statement you want to make for the listeners, especially the young chartered accountants? Uh, you was, you address that to me, Navinji. Uh, so both of you, sir. So your closing statements and uh... no, I I don't have any closing statement. Just tell to tell them that you are living in very exciting times, uh, especially in the tax front. I mean, there's a lot of uh, stuff happening on the international taxation uh, area. Uh, so you know, um, we need to just uh, keep ourselves uh, clued onto it. And uh, and they, as you said, the, the, these are these are very very significant changes. And uh, uh, let's see, but hopefully they're for the good because. Uh, because if it brings more harmonization, you know, in tax collections and uh, that way, that should help and definitely should help the developing world. So uh, just to add to what Ashuto said, uh, certainly very exciting. And I also uh, must say, very at times, very complicated calculations. So it is not going to be as easy, you know. So we need to be so that young chartered accountants will have to uh, put in a lot more effort to understand those things and how each line and how the profits come and etc etc is not going to be as easy uh, so keep uh, you know learning and relearning because uh, that is the age that we are in so i always thought indian taxation laws are the more complex one but now this will add more complexity to the taxation laws <laughs> yeah you're right so all right sir so on behalf of taxmen and all the participants i convey my thanks to both the speakers so it was quite a complex concept, uh, which uh, you, Ashdosh sir, you, you you know simplified it with a lot of case studies. So thanks a lot for taking us uh, through this entire journey for explaining the concept in a very simple language. So uh, till we meet next time. Uh, so goodbye, uh, guys. Uh,